Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Susan Rattan. I am she and her. I'm so terrible at that. And uh, I am your service leader today. We are one of two Unitarian churches in this city. The other one is Westwood. We begin this service with a prelude from Gordon Ritchie on his harp. Good morning. Good morning. That was pretty good. Let's try it once more. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, so much better. Thank you. Good morning. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison. It is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation, and it's so wonderful to see you all here. My, the first thing I'd like to say is to extend a special welcome to the members of the board and staff of the Canadian Unitarian Council. They're with us this morning. Please greet them in uh, CUC love and care and uh, maybe even ask a question or two. <laughs> oh no, says Anne. <laughs> and because it's Welcome Back Brian Sunday and we are in installing Brian as our Minister Emeritus, there is cake afterward. So please, please stay for cake afterwards so that, well, I can't eat it anyway, but you know what I mean, lots of cake. The, the second thing that I want to mention is that um, we're approaching Samhain and next Sunday's service is an intergenerational, all a family-friendly service. And part of the service will be, we will be telling each other real ghost stories. So if you have a real ghost story, please come and be prepared to share that ghost story. And there'll be other activities during the service that we will reflect this spooky thinning of the veil time of year. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Rosemary. Um, and that was your second announcement, right? I'm done. You're done, good. <laughs> This is a happy day for us, a day that we officially welcome back into the fold our retired minister, Reverend Brian Kiley, who becomes our minister emeritus. We have, and we have several out of town visitors. My opening words are going to be quite short. They are so short that I have a version of them as a bumper sticker on my car. 
but I love them. Love is the doctrine of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. We gather in gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. We live in a city that was for many centuries the traditional meeting ground for various indigenous communities, including Cree, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Blackfoot, and others. In 1795, nearly 230 years ago, two rival fur trading companies established trading post here, building on Edmonton's long history as a meeting place. And 75 years after that, the last big fur trading company, the Hudson's Bay, got out of the fur trade business and gave the prairie land that it had controlled for 200 years to the new Canadian government. Twelve years later, the Transcontinental Railway reached Alberta and settlers began pouring in by the thousands every year. We are the settlers and we must remember that long history. May we be remended here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity, to the in mystery and miracle, to the universe, and to this community, and to each other. Now, uh, Sylvia Crow is going to come up and light the chalice. And the chalice words are, may the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve the spirit of freedom. And our first hymn is a favorite, Blue Boat Home, 1064 into the teal, but it'll all be up here.
Our first reading is one that I picked because this is a month uh, in the Soul Matters universe that it has a theme, and the theme is deep listening. And this is an article that I takes deep listening, but is really beautiful. And our reader is our friend, Reverend Ann Barker. Thank you, Susan, for welcoming me back into the fold. It is so good to be here with you in body and in spirit. Um, these words entitled Thanks Be For These are by the Reverend Richard Gilbert, who is one of our wise beings, one of our social justice elders. So it is an honor to share his words with you today. For the sound of bow on string, of breath over reed, of touch on keyboard, for slants of sunlight through windows, for shimmering shadows on snow, for the whisper of wind on my face, for the smooth skin of an apple, for the caress of a collar on my neck, for the prickling of my skin when I am deeply moved, for the pounding of my heart when I run, for the peace of soul at day's end, for familiar voices in family rights, for the faces of friends in laughter and in tears, for the tender human arms that hold me, for the flashes of memories that linger, for the mysterious moments that beckon for the particular, particularity of this instant, for the silence of moonlit nights, for the sound of rain on my roof, of wind in dry leaves, of waves caressing the shore, for the softness of summer breezes and the crispness of autumn air, for dark shadows on white snow, for the resurrection of spring, for the faithful turning of the seasons, for angular leafless trees, for gentle hills rolling in the distance, for meandering streams seeking an unseen sea, for corn stalks at stiff attention, for brittle plants bristling past their prime, for unharvested gardens returning plants to enrich the soil, for the sight of familiar faces, the sound of our spoken names, the welcoming embrace of outstretched arms, for the ritual of friendship, reminding us we matter. Thanks be for these. Thank you, Anne. This community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. So now we will receive the offering. Those who wish a tax receipt can use the envelopes that are found in the gray hymn books at the back. And uh, please put your contact information on the envelope. Now I would invite the volunteers to begin your work. In addition to supporting this church community, we make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. Half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. This month we are sharing our abundance with Camp Firefly, an old friend of this congregation. This summer camp serves as a leadership retreat for queer and trans youth between ages 14 and 24. The camp at, at aims to create a balance between health and wellness, arts-based programming, indigenous-led programming, and workshops on sexuality and gender, anti-oppression, building leadership, and resiliency. 
Throughout the week, everybody engages in an arts program designed by an artist in residence. This culminates in a talent show on the last night of camp. So, and now we are going to sing from you I receive. Whenever Gordon says we can. <laughs> with you this morning on this wonderful occasion. I'm on, but not up. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me? Just about? Yes, I'm hearing, I'm seeing, I'm hearing nods. <laughs> hearing your head, okay. All right. It is my pleasure and honor to conduct the installation process for Reverend Brian Kiley as our Minister Emeritus. I met Reverend Brian a long time ago when I was an aspirant like Alara is now. And back then, aspirants weren't allowed to go to the things. I did cry. Yes, Alara, I did cry. So we were in Vancouver at the Vancouver Canadian Unitarian Council annual conference and meeting and I was sitting on the steps and I was going to Vancouver School of Theology so I knew, I knew campus really well and I was kind of sitting on the steps and peering into the windows where the ministers were and Reverend Brian came up to me and he said, don't worry Rosemary, it's going to happen soon and we are going to open our arms and welcome you with joy. And that has stuck with me. And ever since that moment, Brian has been a mentor, a friend, and a fabulous colleague. Thank you. It has been a pleasure to come here and serve this congregation after Brian's 22 years here. Brian retired January of 2020, and today it is October 20th, 2024. You've served your time. <laughs> it is time that we do this thing. Would you like to come on up here? Let's welcome Brian back. And first, we're going to welcome him back with a round of applause. We're going to do it again. You'll get another chance. Like Kamala said, we got work to do. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, you served this congregation faithfully for 22 years, and now they are bestowing upon you the honor of Minister Emeritus. You have been a fabulous colleague to me while I am here, and I anticipate the same will be true as we move forward in this new relationship. Do you accept the rights, responsibilities, and privileges of Minister Emeritus of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton? I do. Do you promise to be, continue to be a faithful colleague to myself and Alara and Reverend Audrey Brooks and all of the others that show up here from time to time? I promise to be a faithful and non-intrusive colleague. <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> Brian, 
I am so grateful for you, your wisdom, and your mentorship through the years, and now I can hardly wait to be in this new relationship with you. Congregation, please stand. Congregation, you now have a minister emeritus. Do you even know what that means? <laughs> yeah, Brian's going to explain it. Do you promise to respect, honor, and care for the needs right, and the needs of Brian, Reverend Brian Kiley, as he takes on these new duties? We will. We do. Thank you. You may be seated, Brian. I confer upon you in this moment the designation and honor of Minister Emeritus of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Yay! <laughs> we have a token of our appreciation for you. And I look forward to many years working together with you for the betterment of this congregation. Thank you. What a good speaker Brian is, so here he is. <laughs> I didn't have an order of service, so I wasn't sure when I was supposed to do this. Hi. I'm Brian, and though I'm so old, it was before we invented pronouns, I am he, him. First, I want to thank the congregation for granting me this title of Minister Emeritus. It is an honor and the capstone of my career, a sign that I didn't totally screw up my time here. I thank you. The UUMA Code of Professional Practice says, Emeritus status may be granted by a vote of the congregation and at the completion of a minister's long and faithful service in that setting. Typically, the minister emeritus is entitled to a circumscribed continuing place in the life of the congregation, although the minister may go on to serve in other positions elsewhere. The role of minister emeritus must be exercised in such a way as to support the well-being of the congregation and the success of present and future ministers. What this means in practice is that I will be available to accept requests for services with the approval of Reverend Rosemary, but that I will not be very active in the political or committee life of the congregation. That's your job. I am wearing I am old, you know, I'm, I, sometimes I feel older than I am, but uh, I'm wearing a robe that was given to me by my divinity school when I graduated in 1987, and I'm wearing a stole that my mother gave me at my ordination, my very Catholic mother, this was crossing the boundaries, gave me for my ordination later that summer. The title that was stuck in the sermon was my, she always told me, don't get old, when she was feeling particularly arthritic. And in a way, I agree with her because, you know, getting old has a lot of ways it kind of sucks, but it also has one thing that comes with us. You get a lot of experience, you've seen a lot of things, you learn how things can work and maybe not work, and most importantly, hopefully, we learn to shut up and understand that we're not in charge anymore. It is the people in the pews who always in Unitarianism have been in charge, but who may be different generations, younger, thinking differently, wanting things. And that's what I want to talk about today, how Unitarianism has changed in the time I've been involved. It's been 45 years since I first became involved with the Unitarian Church of Montreal in 1979. Our Canadian culture has changed a great deal since then. Most of us in mainstream society in 1979 had only been taught the European settlers' view of Indigenous history. I never even heard of a residential school until I moved west in the 1990s. 
Back then, truth and reconciliation were terms that belonged to the South Africans who were getting over apartheid. In 1979, there was no sense of climate change or even much speaking of the environment. We only worried about pollution. We still believe that a university education guaranteed a good job and a fair wage. <laughs> An awareness of gender inequality labeled still as women's liberation was still working its way into the mainstream culture on its long journey to success. The first great pride march had happened just a few years before on Parliament Hill but the rights of LGBTQ plus people were a long way off. Of course, some things don't change. There was a Trudeau in the prime minister's office, <laughs> at least until June. As for human sexuality, the eight-year-old Unitarian Universalist Association about your sexuality curriculum for youth was highly controversial in the 1970s within and outside of Unitarianism. Imagine a church teaching about sex to teenagers and it didn't even deal with homosexuality. It seems that letting teens know about birth control and showing really bad film strip drawings of people having sex was shocking enough to upset a lot of people. As for the... <laughs> As for the Unitarian theological outlook, we were still a primarily a community of come-outers, meaning that the vast majority of us had come from religious backgrounds from which we had escaped. We asked too many questions that our birth religions could not or would not answer to our satisfaction. We disagreed with their social justice positions that no longer served our needs, like well, birth control. I often tell the story that I left the Catholic Church because Pope Paul had reaffirmed the ban on birth control and that at 17 years old I was desperately hoping to need it soon. <laughs> the statement of principles, we were, sorry, we were religious liberals who defined ourselves primarily by what we weren't. The statement of principles, which sought to create a positive identity for us, was still several years away. A very popular adult religious education course at the time, which I both took and later taught, was owning your religious past. The premise was that until we came, term, came to terms with the religion we had left behind, the bad, of course, but also embracing the good, we could not really embrace a new liberal religious perspective. One impact of that come outer culture was that words like God, church, sermon, sin, were highly controversial. And in some communities, wearing a robe like this was a ticket out the front door. Long before the 1982-92 Gray Hymn Book was published, some congregations began promulgating their own de-godded lyrics to old hymns, uh, most of which have already are in that great hymn book now. They're all de-godded and classified and cleaned up. But at the time, I had one of those blue hymn books and you could open it up and see certain of the hymns where someone had taken a fountain pen, crossed out the God words and written in alternatives. A popular joke at the time suggested Unitarians were such bad singers because we were always reading ahead to see if we agreed with the words. <laughs> We were mistrustful of religion, and yet we were still people who seemed to need a religious community. Now, church words are still a bit sensitive today, but nothing like when back then. Religious words were often fighting words, and I recall that as a new minister visiting the Thunder Bay congregation, I had an old humanist crank stand up and yell at me in the middle of my sermon, for shoving Christianity down his throat because I had dared mention Jesus in a Christmas homily. <laughs> and oh yeah, he was the same guy who he and his wife gave me home hospitality that weekend. Demographically, we are separated from that long deceased gentleman by a generation or two or perhaps even three. 
Unitarianism has become somewhat more tolerant of the idea of religion, perhaps because our newer members and friends have come for different reasons. Fewer of us have been damaged by strict religious backgrounds. Most newcomers have weak or completely non uh, history of religious education in their lives. They come for different reasons, seeking community, seeking a place to explore personal spirituality, or are attracted to other programs we offer. The old words don't seem to be as triggering as they once were. In fact, some people actually come to learn a little bit about what those religious words mean. I'll come back to that. Unitarian Universalism has always been an adaptive tradition. We grew out of the radical reformation of the 16th century. We wanted to think for ourselves about religion instead of having to bow down before creedal beliefs and organizational rules of the Christian church. The move from doctrine to a doctrine free religion took a long time, but the shift was steady. As societies have increasingly moved to humanism and liberalism, our forebears kept pace and often left the way, led the way. We've never deluded ourselves into thinking that we have all the answers, that generations past would suffice for, the, or that the answers of generations past would suffice for current times. That evolutionary adaptability is, I think, one of our true strengths. How have we changed? Well, for one thing, the mainstream majority in Canada is already largely humanist and small l liberal. We are no longer needed as a refuge from overly strict religion. Only about half of Canadians consider religious values to be an important part of their lives. Religion has become voluntary, a luxury for some even, and it is even a bit anachronistic. It is not a societal expe expectation that it once was. There have been significant changes in our ministry as well. Aspirants are welcome now. When I started my study 40 years ago, the majority of ministers were men on a path to parish ministry. The demographic that would change not long after I was ordained in the 80s. Ministers gatherings back then tended to be competitive boys clubs. Who had the most members? Who had the biggest building, the biggest budget, the best programs? The humor among colleagues was often unkind and cutting. And students were often treated to some degree of hazing, especially the women students. They were boys clubs. The increase in the number of women ministers has changed that dynamic for the humanely better. Listening became more important than talking. Empathy replaced competition. The heart was given pride of place. There is now lots more room for minority views in our gatherings. Colleagues are not dismissed for their new ideas or shamed. Sometimes I wonder if perhaps we've gone too far the other way, because I still like solid ideas and debate, but I'm old. I have no doubt if it needs to, it will level out in time. Women ministers have been the majority in our tradition for some decades now, and there is a fair contingent of transgender, non-binary and queer colleagues as well. And ministry is also far less parish based than it used to be. We now have chaplaincy, education rules, social and science ministries, all of those are part of the mix. And the very idea of church has shifted as well. When I joined <clears throat> the First Unitarian Church of Toronto, I didn't actually join in Montreal because there were too many Irish Catholics all around watching me. So that was my historical background. And by the way, thank you for my wild Irish rose. Um, but when I joined, so I waited until I moved to Toronto and joined there. And it was made clear that I was committing to an institution. I would have rights and freedoms, 
but also responsibilities to contribute financially and to provide volunteer time as I was able. There were at least 10 or 12 or maybe more standing committees in most congregations at that time, and they met monthly at, me, at least, and they kept minutes all the time, and they had agendas. And this is back when you were typing with carbons, you know? They manage things, they plan things, they organize things. 40 years ago, you see, people still had faith in institutions. Rightly or wrongly, society was more trusting of leadership, and the social habit was to join, become active, and volunteer. The scandals of clergy sexual abuse were still mostly in the future. And of course, those volunteers tended to heavily be women who had somewhat of a less role in the workforce. Well, the economy and the erosion of the middle class has hurt all of that, of course. Most adults, whether this is their desire or not, have to work outside the home, limiting their availability as volunteers. And this is nothing new. We've been living with that reality for quite some time. And there are more non-church expectations on our volunteer time as well. And most of us have a lot less free money in our budgets to support an institution. The old volunteer committee driven model of church has become hard to maintain. It has gone the way of the dinosaur in many situations. In many UU communities, new ideas are in play with either reduced programs or work shifted over to staff if finances allow. And those budgets often don't which means our programming tends to be scaled back. The church is no longer the social hub it once was. We are lucky if the majority of members are involved in the church once a week on a consistent basis. In Toronto and later in Edmonton here, we used to have canvas dinners to kick off our financial campaigns with at least half of the congregation, maybe more in attendance at these somewhat fancy meals. Participation, while never mandatory, was certainly expected. We just don't see that anymore. Being part of a faith community is no longer a social expectation in almost any Western religious group. Now, I'm not lamenting that. I'm just pointing out how things have changed. As many of you know, I currently serve the Colonial Unitarians part-time, and I get up to visit them once a month. Like many Unitarians, the bulk of our membership is retired persons. And in, effort, in an effort to change that, we hired a 30-something community development manager who is a gifted marketer. She was hired to help us expand our reach into the community and with younger and more diverse populations, and to market our newly renovated building as an arts and social justice hub. It's only been with us for a year, but the change is definitely starting. One key to her success is that older members understood from the beginning that changing and opening the community would mean change, that some of the comfortable things would be challenged or have to find a different place. They wouldn't dominate quite as much. Some room had to be given to newcomers wanting different programs, different approaches, and perhaps a different understanding of what the Unitarian community could be. The old comfortable familiarity would be tested. One of our new manager's points is that her generation, and the ones younger than her, because she's all of 34, are far more interested in a philosophical, spiritual, and intellectual community. And we're testing that phrase now as a marketing tool. They're not so interested in the church. They're interested in the community of spirit and ideas. They want to know what we stand for. They want to see that we are living out our values, not just speaking them. They want to see what organizations we support and partner with, whether justice focused or artistic or spiritual. The traditional of Unitarianism, per se, is less important than community activities today. Traditional Sunday services are of less interest than our actions outside our buildings. Um, service attendance is declined everywhere, not just within Unitarianism, but everywhere. 
And by and large, the younger generations are more focused on activities and events and events and less focused on joining an institution, a church. And most have far less disposable income than previous generations. Among the adaptations Unitarians have to make is how we will finance our congregations. In Kelowna, we are always aware when we're talking about renting our space or sharing our space of whether or not there is a financial aspect that will help us with our bottom line. We're all working on it, but it is often a challenge. <clears throat> the other issue Unitarian congregations face going forward is how to meet the needs of the longtime members who built and cherished a comfortable community that they love while still making space for newer voices who may want something different. As you might imagine, those are pinch points that sometimes create some real tensions. But so far, the dialogue in Kelowna has at least been pretty healthy. The leadership is aware and speaks openly and positively about meeting all kinds of different needs. The willingness to accommodate so far by the older members has been pretty solid. Ask me again in a year and I'll tell you how it's going. Unitarianism has come through a period of declining memberships, declining budgets, but congregations supported by our friends at the Canadian Unitarian Council and by the Ministerial Association have been working faithfully to explore new ideas and try them out, to test programs and theological approaches. We are Unitarians. We adapt. That's in our genetic history. We evolve. Now my time of leadership and style of leadership belongs to a generation past. As Minister Emeritus, not only uh, in this congregation, but kind of unofficially in our denomination, my job is to step back, to help when asked, to provide a bit of historical context now and then, like I'm trying to do today, and to loyally support the new generations of leadership as we continue our evolution. I am honored to accept this new role in my ministry and excited to see how we are going to manage the challenges facing us. And I have faith that we will succeed, but I will also be amazed by the directions we go. Amen. Thank you, Brian. One of the perks of being the service leader, as most of you know, is you get to do your own brief reflection. So here goes. I want to acknowledge one particular thing that I've always appreciated in Brian Kiley. When there's work to do, he's there. He's, he comes forward and helps. It's no surprise that when we had our, soul, our Child Haven lunch two weeks ago, it was Brian who was the MC of that event. And that was, uh, the MC took a bit of work uh, for that thing. But even before the, that lunch started, David Ray told me that the hour before that, he was in a back room here doing service with the Kelowna Unitarians. And uh, yeah, it didn't surprise me. Some years ago, I spent time uh, on the National Church Board and on cer certain national committees. So I got to watch Brian at the national level, which some of us never hear and don't get to do. He uh, was, of course, the president of the National Board for several years. And then he was president of the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists for a number of years and went scooting around the world meeting Unitarians there. When I saw him at the annual meetings, um, and I got to go to the annual conference every year for a period, uh, he was meeting with the other ministers, which is part of the deal. He would be our delegate for the annual 
meeting, and I would see him just talking to people, here, 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 and it occurred to me, he is so well known nationally that people go to him and help, ask for help. This isn't working, or so-and-so didn't show up. Uh, he is a player and has been nationally for a very long time. He is a guy who got the Knight Award um, 13 years ago, I think, or 11 years ago. That's the highest award you can get as a Canadian Unitarian. And he was one of the youngest ever to get that award. De dearest to my heart, dearest to my heart, however, and I want, I want to mention one particular thing, is that Reverend Kiley made possible a new kind of annual congregational dinner for this church. The idea came from me, but Brian made it happen. Our previous dinners for many years had been to go to a hotel dining room and dress up, and I never was part of that. I'm sure it was nice, but it, it, its membership declined year after year. And so for a couple of years then, it became a, di a dinner here with catered food. And I went to that once, and there were about 18 people here. And I, I, it, I just thought, we've got to do better than that. And because I knew it was the cost. Those who know me know I don't care that much about food. So here was my idea, which is a dinner with a $12 ticket for adults, $6 for teenagers and kids, and zero for little kids. And uh, I got approval of that somehow. And I thought, maybe it will just be hot dogs. I don't care. I just want everybody to come. And we didn't have hot dogs. Brian Kiley, you know he's great in the kitchen, he took that really limited budget, he bought the food, he planned the menu, he gathered a team around him, and he made it happen. He made this wonderful dinner, uh, that, and, and everybody ca came. I mean, we had a huge turnouts for that dinner. Um, we, the, the, you will remember we had a theme every year, and it changed every year. And we asked people to dress up in costume. And right from the first year, dressed up in costume, Yvonne and I, second year, it was in the 50s, we went and bought skirt, those big wide skirts, right, to do, do the fabulous 1950s. It was so much fun. And everybody just threw themselves into it. But the basis of all of that was that we had somebody who would take that really limited amount of money and create a dinner for us. For that above all, I thank you, Brian. Now we will have a responsive reading. Lynn Turvey will come up here. She's our board president, and it's going to be number 441. Good morning. <laughs> I'm so pleased to have been asked to participate in this really special service. Thank you. Uh, so as you know, this is the responsive reading. I will read the, um, word, the words in regular type, and there will be uh, italicized words <coughs> coming up for you to respond with. This is called To Worship by Jacob Trapp. It is number 441 in the Grey Hymnals, if you have one of those and would like to follow along there. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars. Before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To worship is not to be silent, to be receptive, before a tree stirred with the wind, or the passing shadow of a cloud. To worship is to work with dedication and with skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. Worship 
is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is the mystery within us reaching out to the mystery beyond. Thank you, Lynn. We will now do candles to recognize the joys and sorrows that touch our lives. Um, I think every, most people know how to do this. We're gonna line up here, get a taper, uh, light it and extinguish it in your water thing there. Okay, please, somebody. <laughs>
Reverend Rosemary will light one last candle for those joys and concerns that are in our hearts. And then when Gordon gets organized, we're going to sing hymn 123, Spirit of Life, which was a weekly favorite when Brian was our minister. We'll sing it through just once. I want to take a minute to thank all those who helped make this service work, particularly since we have been broadcasting our services to people at home. It takes a lot of people. First, of course, our two ministers, Reverend Rosemary and Reverend Brian, and the wonderful Gordon Ritchie on the piano. Mike Keast is the tech producer today, and his daughter, Alicia, is, the, yeah, there she is. Not only, oh, there you are, oh, she's waving. <laughs> she is on the camera. Andrea Graham, who is one of our best choir singers, is doing sound. Uh, the slides are by Doug Eastwell, and Doug and John Sproul are the two guys doing the slides. This So Doug gets to do them more weeks than he doesn't do them. And our coffee guy is the tireless Claire Horn. And just so everybody knows, he makes the coffee and then he waits until all the cups come back and on the dishes or whatever, and then he washes them all. On Zoom is Jane Calderon as a greeter and Lynn Wolf is recording this service, so it will be on YouTube. That's what one service takes, folks. I am missing a few people, I'm sorry. But th th thank you all. Um, final hymn, Wake Now My Senses, and we're singing all five verses.
I invite Sylvia to come forward and extinguish the chalice. And our words for this are by Reverend Brian Kiley. The, the chalice is now extinguished, but its light lifts on in the minds and hearts and souls of each one of you. Carry that flame with you as you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and with those you have yet to meet. All right, all over to Reverend Rosemary. For you words of benediction, I would like to thank Susan Rattan. for creating and putting together this lovely service. And I'd also like to remind you that you must stay for cake. <laughs> Reverend Brian Kiley will be serving up a, a celebration cake to all of us. I might help. And now I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break, and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go and love intentionally. And I invite you to go and love extravagantly, and above all, go and love unconditionally, for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within all of you. So go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And now we will sing our linking song, Carry the Flag. Here, and, and um, hold hands if you like, and don't hold hands if you don't. <laughs>